This is Shapes, a triple VCO module that I designed and built from scratch. It houses three independent analog oscillators that provide two switchable wave shapes each. Sawtooth and pulse with variable width. The third one even has the ability to seamlessly blend between the two. And of course, all oscillators conform to the volt per octave standard, so they play nice with most sequences that put out a CV signal. In this video, I'll walk you through the practical building process, translating the schematic into a stripboard layout, designing and making a panel, soldering everything together, and then assembling it to get the finished product. I won't delve into the inner workings of my circuit here, because I've already done this in a four-part series that you can find on my channel. So if you're curious about the theory, check those videos out, and if you're not, this should still be useful if you want to build your own module. We'll start out with the schematic for a single VCO. You can find this, along with all other sheets I use here, available for download on my Patreon. Now, while this might seem like a huge mess of components at first, you'll quickly notice that there's mainly two ICs that everything revolves around. A 4106 Hex Schmidt trigger inverter and a TL074 quad op amp. Here's the two inverters and there's the three op amps that we're using. So if we were to build just a single VCO, we'd be wasting four perfectly usable inverters and one op amp. Because that'd be a shame and a single oscillator is not all too exciting, I decided to step it up and go triple instead. Now, if you don't care for the variable pulse width and would be cool with a fixed 50% square wave, you could even get six individual oscillators out of one 4106 IC. But since I like to have the flexibility and I don't want my panel to become too huge, I'm sticking to my original design. There's one slight alteration that I've implemented though. In my original design, I've drawn individual outputs for each waveform. While I'm sure there's some uses for that, I haven't really found any yet. So to save some space, I decided to have a single output per oscillator that can be switched. And while I was thinking about this, I realized that I still had some op amps left. So I came up with a way to blend between the two waveforms and added that as a special goodie for the third VCO. If you want to know more about how that works, again, there will be an in-depth explanation on my Patreon soon. With that out of the way, let's talk about panels. If you're trying to design a panel, I've found it to be most helpful to first draw up a life-size template of the format you've chosen. In my case, I'm using a big non eurorack format that Sam over at Look Mum No Computer popularized. The reason being that I don't really like small audio jacks and prefer my synth to look kind of bulky and imposing. So the base dimensions for my blank panel are 10 by 20 centimeters. The first thing I usually do is mark the space that will be blocked by my case's rails, just to be sure that I don't place any components there. Next, I'll divide the panel into four columns, one for each VCO, plus an extra strip where the labels will go. Then we'll have to decide on a layout for the control elements and connectors. There's six per VCO, a coarse tuning pot, a fine tuning pot, a waveform selector, a pulse width pot, a CV input and an output socket. And yes, I am omitting the FM inputs from the schematic. To be sure I get the dimensions right, I'm toying around with the actual components. If you try this yourself, remember to not cram the components too close together. It might be difficult to assemble otherwise. This setup works for me, so I draw rough outlines where the actual components will go. Also, I'm adding the exact positions for where we will need to drill later, 
And that's all there is to the component layout for a panel. Though we'll have to come back to this once we know where the mounting holes for our circuit board are going to go. To figure that out, let's take our schematic and translate it into something buildable. For that, there's a bunch of roads you could take. You could design a PCB layout and have it produced by a PCB prototype service. You could use regular perf board, which is basically a blank PCB where you create the connections between components yourself. Or, and this is what I like to do, you could use stripboard. A stripboard has these strips of copper on the back that each connect an entire row of holes together. This way, all leads soldered to the same row are making contact. No need to connect them manually, like with the perf board. On the other hand, you'll have to frequently break the copper strips to prevent contact between components that shouldn't connect to each other. But for me, that feels a lot less tedious. Before we can get to soldering, we should really draw up a layout on paper first. If you're doing a really simple project with just a handful of components, this might not be necessary. But in our case, just trying to wing it will definitely lead to a lot of frustration, even if you're just doing a single VCO. There's just too much that could go wrong and then unnoticed. Now, for layout drawing purposes, I prefer using this dotted type of paper. I like to imagine that every dot represents one hole on the strip board, and each row is connected horizontally like this. Then I'll try to arrange the components as to replicate the connections shown in the schematic. I won't lie to you, this takes a bunch of attempts and some patience. Here's all the failed versions I've already discarded, so the run I'm about to do will be far from my first try. Now that that's done, it's time to double and triple check with the schematic, just to be really sure that there's no mistakes. And then we're good to start transferring this onto an actual piece of stripboard. The first thing I always do is draw the power supply lines. Because we're not using the full-sized board, I also draw the final dimensions and then cut the board with a standard box cutter. Next, I first place and then solder the chip sockets, because you can't really bend their legs and make them stay in place like you can with most other components. Then, I place all the remaining components. There's a small catch concerning the transistors and thermistors. To make the VCOs as independent of ambient temperature as possible, I use thermal adhesive tape to bond them together. Time to solder all those legs down. This is kind of messy, because I do all of the components at once. You could of course also do them in smaller batches, but I got used to doing it this way, and I think it might be a little faster. Finally, I mark the spots where we'll need to cut the copper later, plus where the panel connections will go. It's important to cut the copper strips as short as possible, because otherwise they might start acting as antennas and pick up signals from around the circuit. To cut the copper, I use a small drill bit. The process is a little finicky, because there might be very slim traces of copper left that you have to check for and cut as well. Finally, we'll have to decide where we'll put the mounting holes, and then drill them carefully. To be safe, I cut the copper next to the mounting holes too, because the screws are making contact with the panel, which will be grounded. Now that we have the mounting hole placement for the circuit board, we can decide where we will drill their counterparts on the panel. This is mainly a spacing issue because the sleeves I use to mount the board to the panel 
need to fit between the potentiometers and other components. With the layout done, we can now get to building the actual panel. For that, I first tape our layout directly onto the blank panel, so that I know exactly where to drill. For drilling the holes, I'm using a run-of-the-mill power drill with bits made for metal specifically. If you want your holes to be consistent in the exact placement, I'd recommend drilling pilot holes first using a very small drill bit. Onto the actual holes. Their sizes vary depending on the component. For the mounting holes, I'm using a 4mm bit. The switches get 6mm, the potentiometers need 8mm holes, and for the jack sockets, we'll need the biggest holes at 10mm. With all the holes done, I now sand the aluminum down to smooth the edges and prepare for the lacquer. To get the labels onto the panel, I've found a technique that, in my opinion, looks quite nice. First, I draw up the logo plus labels and other flair on paper and cut them out using a precision knife. Next, I glue them to the panel in the spots I want them to appear later. I initially planned to have a master CV input here, but I couldn't get it to work properly, so I'll have to work on that some other time. Then I apply a few coats of black spray paint and let it dry. Once it is dried, I remove the paper. And here's how it looks after some cleanup. To protect everything and make it look a bit more consistent, I apply a few coats of clear lacquer on top. Almost done. Now we need to mount all the control elements to the panel. There's another small catch here. Some potentiometers have these tiny protrusions next to the knob axis. Ideally, you would also drill small holes for these, but I found that the potentiometers have a good enough grip on the panel without them. So I usually just cut them with pliers. Once that's done, mounting all these components should be pretty much self-explanatory. There's a few resistors that I didn't put on the board. And that's why I'm now soldering them directly to these potentiometers. From there, I'm using a whole bunch of wires to connect the board to the panel. Then, I add the power connector. I use these simple three-pin connectors that you can find very easily and for cheap. And finally, I'm mounting the circuit board onto the panel using two spacer sleeves. And with that, our module is done. But before I put it in my modular, let's make sure that it actually works. So I'll connect my bench power supply and check if all three oscillators show signs of life. Luckily, they all do. So now I'll make room in my case and then install the module. If you're interested in how the tuning process works, again, check the other videos in this series. Because I went into it in detail there, I'm going to leave it out here. And that's it for this video. I'll leave you with a quick jam session to demonstrate how the module sounds in action. If you've enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it in the future, consider supporting me on Patreon. Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.